This week, the Claret edge ever closer to safety, with a hard-earned point against the Gunners, thanks to an interesting finish for our main striker. This is the Known and Never podcast. So, go on, I'll, I'll kind of ask the first question. I'll go to George, because I know you're leaving a little bit shortly. So, good evening, everyone who's listening in. So, on the back of a, an interesting game against Arsenal, uh, obviously, first half, I, I thought we was pretty poor the first half an hour, and then, obviously, Xhaka, um, who's probably been our best player this season, obviously, assisted another goal for us. Uh, so, George, what what was your thoughts on just, just on the goal? I was in complete shock when it, when it went in. I... I don't think I actually celebrated, really. It's one of them, you, f- you feel bad celebrating, really. It feels a bit cheap. Uh, yeah, it was a strange one, wasn't it? Just completely out of the blue. But, I mean, it's, oh, it's such a lovely goal to, to get when a, t- a team messes about with it at the back, playing this fancy, stupid football. Well, it's all well and good when you can score a nice-looking goal, but you like right fools when that happens. And I think, obviously, Chris Wood deserves a, a, so much credit for that. Just the way he, he used his hit to angle the ball, the technique on it was fantastic. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, that's what you pay the big money for. A man just to stand there and let the ball hit him. Oh, 15 million well spent. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. But it's a funny one, isn't it? I'll go back to the first goal in a minute. I'll stick with you, George, because I think Tom's still eating his tea. Um, so I don't know what he's munching down on there, but it looks pretty good. Um Obviously, Arsenal scored the first goal and you could say that was a result of playing out from the back and, and beating the lines and obviously William got in that space and then fed a Bamiyan. But, you know, what's your view on it, George? Is it, do you think teams play out too much for the bas- uh, from the back or is it risk and reward? Because ultimately, Arsenal got a goal from it but conceded one. I think sometimes teams overestimate how good they are. I mean, you can't really blame the likes of City for playing out from the back. I mean, it serves them well. And to be fair, they've absolutely played teams off the park this season. You know, they're looking in fine form again. You know, people like that, fair enough, playing out from the back. But Arsenal, I mean, they're still in like this transition year. Their team's pretty naff, to be honest, apart from a few good results here and there. It just seems a bit silly, really. Like, especially away from home, they're already 1-0 up. I mean, why why even try it? It just, it just seems daft. And they end up looking stupid when stuff like that happens. I mean, that's an obvious error that's happened but even when we just uh, press and take the ball off them it happens so often and just puts them under a lot of pressure I think the key point you made there George which or, or the one that I took the most kind of um, interesting was the one where you went but the one they'll up so why do that and yeah then, obviously Tom I think you tweeted after the game you're not a fan of it at all are you the you know the passing out from the back or maybe over passing out from the back shall, shall we say yeah the thing is it's exactly what George said if you've got the players for it and it works, then fantastic. You know, Man City do it brilliantly and uh, you know, nobody will criticise them for doing it because they've got the players. But the problem is you've got so many managers now who just copy what the top teams are doing. So, And obviously, I know Arteta's worked with Guardiola, so he's got the influence there as well. But he hasn't got the players to do it. Is Jackie good enough to be spraying it about from the back? I can't understand how he's still getting picked for Arsenal, to be honest. He's not a very good player, in my opinion. And I think he proved it there by looking up, seeing there's a bloke in his way, and still trying to chip it over his head with his weaker foot, which he's not capable of doing. So I think if you're Arteta, like, brilliant, you've got these principles, you've worked under Guardiola, but until you've got a midfield like Guardiola's, you've got to be more pragmatic. And it, 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 to be fair, he's not the worst culprit, because I, I swear, I, you know, I like to watch the EFL highlights. Once a week you see Crawley or Morkham give away a goal because they're passing it sideways between the centre half completely pointlessly. And it's like, if you're playing centre half for Crawley, it's not because you're a good footballer, is it? So, you know, play play to your strengths. Play the play the card you've been dealt. Uh, I'm sure, you know, if you put a Tarkovsky in Man City's team, he could do it, I think. But you know, you, you can't you can't be having Westwood coming in and or you know or Court coming in taking that and, and expecting them to ping it about between the centre halves. Just you know, no chance. So it's not for me. I, I think great, you know, if if it works, but it's so high risk that it's just ludicrous. To, you know, three quarters of the teams that are doing it shouldn't be touching it. Yeah, no, I, I agree with both of your points, sir. And I think if the ball's on to play out from the back, and then you can, and then you can get it through midfield, then yeah, that's fine. I think we've we've actually tried to do that a little bit more late, but 
where was, you know, you can maybe put a bit of blame on Leno there. Like, why is he actually pass it to Xhaka in the first place? Who, who is he going to pass it to? You know, just get it long and you know, just get out, out of danger. But obviously that got us back into the game. As I mentioned at the start, I thought the first half an hour was pretty, well, until we scored, actually, we was, we was pretty poor and then we did get better at that. Another bit of a soft goal to concede, though, George, wasn't it? Yeah, totally. And it's, it's just a shame you can concede soft goals, but then there's also conceding soft goals early on in the game. And it just deflates the whole team, really. Especially when you're set up to go for a nil-nil and try and nick a winner at some point against a team like Arsenal. It just to concede a soft goal like that early. And, you know, Lawton just didn't offer anything. He's been brilliant this, this year, absolutely brilliant. But he didn't offer any resistance to Aubameyang cutting in there. And it's just, a, it is a really soft goal. And after only six minutes of play, it's just a, a punch in the gut. I mean, fortunately enough, obviously, we, we got back into it. But at the time when it went in, it's one of them where you're thinking, oh, no, here we go, 3 nil incoming. Uh, so, yeah, we, if we could cut that out, brilliant. Uh, but I, I wouldn't spend too much time to, dwelling on a, a, an error like that. OK, well, I am going to ask another question on it. Uh, <laughs> sorry, George. Obviously, I think you mentioned Lawton and, and he's the first mistake. But to me, Taki was quite poor. I don't. He like went on the inside as well, as just staying in his position. And then obviously, I'm not going to criticise Taki too much. He's been outstanding, and obviously, Paul made a little bit of a mistake. But um, Tom, I just want to see your thoughts. Yeah, I'm. I'm interested to hear more about what George thinks about it. If he's got any more opinions. <laughs> no, I'm being cruel there. George has just said in our chat he didn't actually see it. No, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take over. You did well there, George, for saying you're not saying it, mate. It's a good opinion. So, yeah, I think that what we pride ourselves defensively on is, like, it's narrowing the, the angle from which you've got to shoot. So you've got, um, normally it's a case of funneling it, so it's an easy shot for Pope to save, and that's part of the reason why he's got such a good record, you know. Um, and I, that's the problem there is, like like you say, they've done the opposite. So Lowton's shown him inside to have the shot, fine, that's what you do, because then you've got Tarkovsky behind that you think will come and narrow it and, and stop, you know, narrow the angle. And he's either going to shoot straight at Pope or he's going to shoot at the, uh, at, you know, at the, at the defender. But I don't know why Tarkovsky goes the other way. Perhaps he's anticipating. He's been tripped by a little shimmy or something. I'm not sure. But it, it means that there's more of the goal to aim at for Aubameyang. And he puts it low in the corner. Now, I've seen Pope get quite a lot of criticism. I think a little harsh, because I think it's hard to get down to that as quick as he does and get a strong hand to it. I think he can re- realistically, he can do one or the other there. And I think he gets down to it and gets the hand on it. But the, the, because he's so near and he's got that bit of the goal to aim at, he can't get a strong enough hand on it to keep it out. So it's a, it is a failure defensively for me, that. But it, it's going to happen. You know, we, what we do is we, we defend very deep, we defend very narrow, and we invite teams on. And, you know, you'll make the odd mistake and maybe some weeks you won't get punished. But if it's a Bamiyang... Nine times out of ten, you will do. It's just how it is. Yeah. Plus, plus with Paul, uh, uh, six foot seven or whatever he is. I mean, it's harsh to say it. he has to get down to that and get a strong hand on it. You know, we have the benefits of Port being so tall at corners. You sort of, you sort of counter into that. That fair enough. Some low shots that come at him quickly, he's not going to get down to. It's just pros and cons having a, t- a tall goalkeeper like that. And I think we see more benefits than we do uh, negatives of having him. Well, I thought he should have saved it, but anyway, we'll we'll move on. Um, so, <laughs> George, I'll, I'll just come to you, mate. Have you watched any of the game? By the way, I saw after literally like the first fifteen minutes. Um, but obviously, by then we won no down. Okay, so so I can. What was you doing then? How come? I know it's an earliest kickoff. Was you still in bed? What was you doing on Saturday morning? I think I had. A, I think I was at the dentist. Yeah. Yeah, that's a not a good excuse for missing a Clarets game. The dentist. I'm really sorry. I don't, man. you know, even if it was my wedding day, I'd get it moved. I'm really sorry, but you know, I, I was engaged at the dentist, and it was an emergency <laughs> appointment. But I, I, I only said that because the missus has walked in and just gave me a glare. So <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll no, see but your, I right. might go off in a minute, and you'll be uh, walking yeah, on the green. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, just come in like Grim, Grim Reaper. <laughs> uh, I can see a shadow so. lurking. One with Man City away, that one with Man City away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man City away, got a dentist, yeah. But I was saying that half 12 kickoff, it can either make or break your weekend, could it? But a draw was just a quite a nice one. Just to, you know... It, 
I wasn't too high, I wasn't too low with it. So, George, I'm just trying to gather what what you see now. I'll move to the second half then, because because you said you you know just to stay safe. So, I'm I'm sure what incidents there was in, but I thought similar to the Leicester game, we started the second half really well, and I thought we was actually the better team. We took the game to Arsenal. Uh, so, just give me the you know your thoughts on that then. Yeah, definitely, definitely, we were much improved second half. Well, from what I'd said after the first 15 minutes, uh, we were much improved. And I think players like McNeil really got into the game. And it's, it's one of them where you're happy enough just to defend for 90 minutes and get a draw. But it was nice to see us being proactive and, and getting on the, the front foot against them and really putting them under pressure. Um, obviously, there wasn't like a, a major cut, cutting edge chance. But at the same time, you know, we, we did look good going forward. And even with a, a, a thin squad that we have at the moment, and we've been through a sort of a, a rocky patch. Um, I thought it was a good performance. And at the end of the day, a draw is a, a, a cracking result. You didn't expect to get anything from this game, you know, at the start of the season, let's say. Um, so I think we were just really impressed with the performance and obviously just taking the point as it is. Yeah, so like I said, I'll come on to the... Because obviously the last half an hour was filled with incidents. So I'll, I'll come on, we'll come on to those and break them down. But just one gripe I've got, and I've had for a while... Is so corners right? I'm mentioning it again. It we we went from having some decent corners, and now we've gone to hitting it straight at the goalie again. And also, what was going on with our crossing? It was either straight at the goalie, or just blast, or or didn't beat the first man, or out in or out in the stand. You know, do you two share my frustration, or am I being really again over fussy on it? No, I love our corners. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah. No, honestly, honestly, I actually do quite like them. I like, I like us putting the goalkeeper under pressure and putting it around. But it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Like, watch the goals we've scored from corners this year, and come back to me with come back to me. That's all I'll say. Most of our goals have been scored from around the six yard. I think there was one with Rodriguez where that great is absolutely useless. The rest, you know, me scored two headers: one against Sheffield, one against uh, Villa. They're around the six yard line. And we've yeah, gone Palace, bloody hit. Palace as well. Yeah, and we've gone hitting it straight at the goalie. Again, it's just brought up my annoyance. Go on, Tom. George has annoyed me, so I, I want to get <laughs> your thoughts. The final ball all game was terrible, to be fair. You're right. I don't think it's just the corners. I think it's the, the crossing. To be fair, there's some keepers that it works on, like the pen that flap at it. I think Leno is one of the better ones, to be fair. I think he reacts better. And as well, the other thing is, like you say, teams have worked it out now. There's, uh, there's a time and a place for it, and I don't think it's completely ineffective, but just mix it up a bit. You know, put one down the keeper's throat, then put the other two, you know, to the penalty spot or something, stick them up at the back stick to head back across. Don't seem to do much of that anymore. Yeah, you're right. I think they have got a bit one-dimensional, but of that, to be fair, the crossing was that bad. They could have been aiming some of them at their far face and they're just getting it wrong. Yeah. You stand with the delivery that was on Saturday. Okay, yeah. So, anyway, move, moving on for that. I've had me more... No, I I get what you mean, George. I think some games it's effective, but I think it's, I think Tom summed it up well. It, it's too, it's just all the time now, and I think it it does get easy to, um, you know, to anticipate. I, th- I think there was one corner we did a bit shorter, and McNeil whipped it in, and Vidra got a header, and maybe it's a bit lower. He could have scored. So we'll you know we'll come to the last part of the game where it was in- incident packed. I'll come on to Eric Peters. So he thought he'd have a quiet afternoon, sitting on the bench, probably going home back to his lovely missus. After that, and then all of a sudden he's involved in literally every single incident in the game. Oh, brilliant! I, I, and uh, before we go on to talk about the handball, Barkles, <laughs> that that thirty-yard hit. Oh, absolutely, wow, yeah. absolutely <laughs> smashing! He's got a proper, he's got a, a serious left foot on him as Peters. He scored a couple of cup goals for us where he's absolutely pinged it from outside the box, and just to see that dipping shot, oh. It's a shame it got saved, obviously. They've been a, a goal of the season contender for sure. Uh, and obviously, that the handballs were filled with controversy. But I think we got very, we got semi-lucky with one of them. And then the, the the one that was overturned, I think, was a correct decision. It, def, it, you know, it definitely did hit his shoulder. And it, it was really good last gasp defending from both him uh, and Tarks on the line behind him. I thought, he, I thought we got very lucky with the first hand ball. I thought when I saw it first time, because it's different when you watch on tele, it only seemed to show one replay on Sky 2. I actually thought he did move his arm towards it a little bit, but 
you know, listen, we've had some really bad decisions go against us at Arsenal over the years, so I couldn't, you know, I couldn't really care less. Um, but Tom, you're normally quite, you know, relaxed, reserved, not reserved, that's, that's the wrong word, but quite relaxed and, and, and calm. You know, definitely the most calm of all the known and ever, you know, panellists. So obviously there was the Peter shot, there was the Wood chance, which he should have scored, but I don't think he did too much wrong. Obviously the handball incidents then, did, did he hit the post in the last minute as well, I think? You know, and balls were coming into the box. So was you calm or was your heart rate even getting higher top, Mr. Cool? Uh, a lot of it come out of the blue, didn't it? Because you would have been forgiven for, for having a very low heart rate after the first hour, where especially the first 15 minutes of the second <laughs> half, not a lot happening, neither keeper having much to do. Uh, like I say, Peters came on and it was an element of chaos to the game. Um, I think we've we've all neglected to mention my favourite Eric Peters incident, which was the uh, the attempted assassination of Alexander Lacazette. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, wow. <laughs> the scream was uh, it's still ringing in my ear. Wow, yeah. unbelievable! How did he get a yellow card for that? I can't believe the rest fell for that. Shocking. I thought he was perfect. Yeah, yeah. La- Lacazette. It was I like I just. I can't believe refs are falling for that in this day and age. You know, I think he's tried to make him think that he's raped right down the back of his car, funny, um, with the 400 forward rolls and the pathetic scream. And, and the refs, he's bought it and booked him. But, like, but yeah, unbelievable. Um, you, you think you're a grown man and everyone can see you doing that. It is, it is embarrassing. But, you know, it's Arsenal and it's what we get every time we come. So I <clears throat> can't say as I was surprised. The shot, like you say, phenomenal. I think if he aims that far corner, that that shot, that's the goal. I don't think Leno can reach that if it's in the far corner. So that was really unlucky. And the handballs. <clears throat> so for me, I think we all said it for the second one, the VAR. It's not handball, it's his shoulder. Why the referee? I mean, it must... I can only, The only benefit of the doubt I can give there to that referee is that he's guessed and he's hoping that VAR will tell him the right answer because... I always, I always give a red card and a penalty for that in about two seconds when it's not at his arm. I mean, again, it's the typical kind of, of the refereeing that we get against Arsenal. But I, I can't believe he'd be so quick to run over and give him a red card for that. Because at, at, at best, he's guessed. At worst, he's made it up. So, yeah, it's lucky that we had the VAR for that one. And obviously, a, a few a few fixtures against Arsenal, we could say that down the years. But, so that's the less controversial one. If we move on to the uh, to the first one, I could I wouldn't have complained if that had been given. I'm probably in the in the middle of the two of you. So for me, it's it's hard. It would be harsh to call that deliberate handball because Pepe, I mean, 72 million quid, he couldn't beat an egg. He knows he's got no chance of getting round in there, so he's just kicked it at his arm to get a penalty. But if you stood there with your arm out in the box and it hits your arm, you're asking for trouble, aren't you? Now I think. He's a yard away, so the proximity argument is what saved him there because he can't get his arm out of the way in that time. But why has he stood there with his arm up in the first place? Stupid defending. And if he'd have given a penalty for that, the VAR wouldn't have overturned it. And uh, I don't think we could have complained, really. So we've got a bit lucky with that one for me, definitely. You know, that's, I think, yeah, really good review of the of the final incidents of, of the game. Um, George, I'll kind of... Let you have the final point on on the Arsenal result. Are you, obviously, I know Wood had that really good chance, and 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 at two one with maybe ten minutes left, you know Arsenal may not get those penalty appeals, they may not get the chance. But do you think it's a really good point gained in the end? Yeah, and um, obviously the Wood chance. I, I, I'm not as harsh as other people in saying you know he should have scored. I think he gets a good contact on it. And it's unfortunate that it goes just wide of the target. You know, I'm not too critical of him on that. Vidra did very well to get a good ball into the box. But then at the end of the day, it, it is a good point. And taken at the start of the season, it's one of them where it's a bonus point, really. But I think in the situation we are, and with Fulham's result, it was a point that, in hindsight, we sort of needed to get. And now we're looking a lot, a little bit more rosy than if we'd have lost that game and Fulham would have then picked up their result as well. So I think with the, the teams just below us, or in particular Fulham, sort of coming into a bit of form, it, it was one of them where the Leicester result and the Arsenal results have definitely helped us out where we maybe couldn't have expected expected points prior. So, so I'm happy with both of the results and it's a nice way to tee us up for uh, the, the coming games. Uh, so that's all I'll say on it. And, uh, and then I'll, I'll have to bid you all adieu, gentlemen, as I've got the, the university meeting now, but it's been cracking speaking to you. 
enjoy the rest of the pod. Cheers, George. Thanks for having you on. Make sure you go away and watch um, Aubameyang's goal then. <laughs> I will do. That's my homework <laughs> for the week. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, mate. Good one. Catch you soon. So, obviously, Tom, there's a um, Fulham... Well, I wouldn't say they got a brilliant win it, on, on paper, but I thought Liverpool were absolutely dire. I think in all the games that Liverpool have lost, that, that is the worst they played. When I seen Liverpool's team sheet, I thought... They've got a really good chance here, Fulham, and you know they played okay. They got the goal, um, you know, and they defended very well. I know there's a bit of obviously me and you have a little bit of banter over Fulham. I actually think they're a decent side. I think since the first ten games of the season, they've, especially since January, since they've signed some good players, in my opinion, the to me they're better than a relegation side. That doesn't necessarily mean they will stay up because they're still a little bit behind, and maybe that Premiership now uh, now to you know to pick up difficult points. Um, obviously, with Fulham picking up, Brighton have gone on a losing streak. Newcastle, look, there's a bit of trouble in the camp. Are you, are you any more worried? I know you've always backed us to, you know, to, to, to stay up even during that bad run. Yeah, I think uh, you. I think you're right about Fulham. I think a lot of people have gone a bit overboard. I mean, obviously, when we won at Liverpool, it ended that streak. But since since then, it's not. It's not looked quite as incredible as, as a result as it did on that night because everyone goes there and beat them now. I said to you on Sunday, if you put Aki Stanley up against that team at Anfield, they'd have had a good chance. And I, I'm only half joking when I say that. You know, it's not just the, uh, you know, the the personnel, the confidence, the form. It's all gone there. It, and Klopp looks like he he looks a bit of a broken man. Bless him. You know, obviously what everything that happened with his mum and all that. I think he could probably do with a bit of time at the firing line. So I think, you know, you've still got to go there and win it. So take nothing away. It's a, it's a good result for Fulham. But mm-hmm. it's not the result that it was, you know, a few weeks ago. Having said that, what I think my major criticism of Fulham was, you know, everyone says, oh, they play great stuff. They, do, they, do. They, don't, they, they don't score many goals and they don't win many games. But what they are starting to do now is turn it into results. So I think they've won is it three of the last six or something, whereas before that they'd won two of about 20-odd. Uh, to me, you can play as well as you want, but if you're not winning games, it's completely pointless. But they are showing that they can win games now. So if they can put two or three of them together, which I think is probably the, the last missing piece of the puzzle for them, then they have given themselves a good chance. And they're taking advantage of the fact that, as you said, Brighton are in free fall. Talk about teams who pass it about and can't score. And then Newcastle, like you say, with there's a very they're in a similar position to what we were at the start of the season. So... Uh, they've got a couple of injuries in a position where they haven't got players to replace them and uh, and that's taking its toll for them as well. But a lot can change, you know. We've got this weekend uh, of fixtures and then there's a bit of a break. There's FA Cup and then there's international. So that gives teams a chance to get players back, get a bit of a rest, get a bit of form. So I think uh, it'll be interesting to judge because I know Fulham have got Man City this weekend. I know I said I didn't fancy him to beat Liverpool, but I definitely don't fancy him to beat Man City. Mm-hmm. So you mm. think probably it's going to be at least the same. If not, you know, we, if we can get one or three points, if uh, I think Newcastle have got Villa, that's not a, it's not a hundred percent. You know, it's not nailed on defeat. Um, not sure if Brighton have got Brighton have got Southampton. I think off the top of my head, so that's a, a winnable game as well. So you never know. In, in a week's time, we might be sitting here in Fulham are five or six points adrift of everybody again, and then the, the, the pressure's all on them for the running when while while teams have got a chance to bring players back. But, um, yeah, in, in terms of us, I think, you know, if we can get anything at Everton, that'll be a bonus. Uh, even if we don't, we've got that cushion. Uh, keep, you know, uh, and I think that the running for us is easier than it is for other teams. We've got some winnable games in there. We are probably realistically only need three wins and we'll be all right. So I'm still very confident. I'm not one of these who's checking uh, the last 10 games for everybody or anything just yet. Yeah, I think you summarised it really well, Tom. And, and again, in your... Um, calm, well thought out manner. I, I'm so confident that we stay up because we are playing better. I, I think you made a really good point there about having a bit of a break, and I think there's going to be less midweek games. You know, during the running now, with with our sm- small squad, will definitely help us. You know, I think normally when we do have a break, we do come back with a better performance. Um, you know, so that'll benefit us. I personally think Fulham will actually stay up. I think they've got enough. I think they're defensively actually good. I really like that Anderson, who plays centre half for them. I think he's a leader. And uh, say, but, if, but if he gets injured, I think they could struggle. Um, I, I actually think 
Brighton are a funny one. I'm 50-50 on Brighton. You know, you can't deny it. They play some nice, attractive football. But like you said, Tom, they don't score. And they're not as good as... I actually think Fulham are better at, at the back at, at this cup coming time than Brighton. But I think Newcastle are the one who, who are in a little bit of trouble. I know Wilson's got to come back from injury. But there's a lot of trouble in the camp there. But it's again, will Bruce have that little bit of know-how to, you know, to you know, to keep him up and grind points out? Yeah, I think we'll be far, fine. I actually think we'll finish fifteenth where we are now. So Tom, you mentioned three wins. So obviously that takes us to thirty-nine points, not including us drawing any games. Let's say worst case scenario, how many points do you think we need to get to actually stay up this season? I think it's going to be a bit higher than other seasons, in my opinion, though. I don't think so, you know. I think you can get a bit carried away by a weekend's result. So you can look at it on paper and say, I'll oh, follow them on this weekend. Okay. They can win another three, four. If you, I think if you take a step back and look at it in the context of the season, so Fulham have played 28 games, they've won five of them. I know, as I said, they've won a few more in the last few games than they had the rest of the season, but I don't see them winning three, four games. I, I think four is, is about as much as they'll get of the last 10 wins-wise. So that's 12 points. And we're four points above them at the minute. So that that would leave us needing eight points to finish above them guaranteed. And that's if they do win the four. So that's two wins, two draws or three wins. And, and you're finishing above Fulham, in my opinion. And then, you you know, you can say the same about Newcastle and, and Brighton. Can you see them winning three or four of the last ten? I think Brighton have won five all season. Newcastle, maybe it's a few more, six or seven. But I don't, you know, and the same goes for us. You know, we're not going to win five or six of our last ten, but two or three is realistic, and and that's all we, we need to win. And so I think what are we on now, thirty. I think thirty six, thirty seven will probably do it. But I think thirty eight, thirty nine will we'll see. You absolutely, absolutely sure. Yeah, I think you made a good point there. There's three teams below us, so you've got to have three teams who are going to have considerably better form than us to stay up. You know, or or every one of those three teams to have one more win than us. Is that, you know, in Fulham, two more wins and a, and, and a draw? I, I think, this, you know, this is the end of the season where we've has historically, you know, with 30 games, uh, 20, you know, with 10 games to go, we have pulled out results. Um, so, yeah, there's 10 games. I think personally we'll average out at a point a game from the remaining 10, similar to what we're doing at the moment. And we'll finish around for about 40 points, give or take one or two. Either the, and, and I think we'll be absolutely fine. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's going to be really interesting. I just, what I'd like us to do, obviously, Everton away, they've not got a great home record um, against some of the, you know, some of the weaker teams, as you should say. And quite a few people I work with, and some of them listen to this podcast, are massive Everton fans. So probably my biggest game of the season. So I really hope we stuff them. Um, and then obviously we've got Southampton after that. I think if we get a win from one of these next two games, I think that'll give everybody a lot of confidence and we can breathe a little bit easier. But I think if we have a few games where we don't win again, you know, you got to you're you're saying Fulham haven't won that much, Tom. I think we've only won one game since the end of January, which was Palace away, and we've had injuries in 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 that time, you know, and and, and different things. So, you know, Fulham to me are the informed team down at the bottom, and they're getting better and better. So that's why I think they'll stay up. But I think we'll come 15th where we are now and get another between 9 and 12 points at the end of the season. And, and I think we'll be absolutely fine. Um, so, yeah, so that's kind of my, my prediction. But listen, you know, we'll we'll see. You know, we've we've got an opportunity this, this weekend to possibly go five or seven points above Fulham. Because I think, you know, the, you know I can't see him getting anything against City. Um, so, yeah, fingers crossed. Just one thing I, I do want to mention before we move on to stuff that's been happening away from the pitch is um, there was a lot of um, like horrendous, vile abuse hurled, hurled at Eric Peters on his Instagram just because, you know, he, the ref didn't give a penalty. I'm not going to repeat some of the stuff that it was said because it's because it is very vulgar. But if you're a Burnley fan or any other football fan and you think that type of abuse is OK in a social media platform, you really need a serious thing for yourself. So that's just me going, a, you know, a little bit of a deeper message beyond football because I think that's really important there's a difference between saying somebody's crap and then giving them actually like like I said vulgar abuse you know you know there's a bit of banter isn't there but like I said if it just really disappointed me that and and, and I think Twitter and social media you know we've seen obviously it's getting at a breaking point so if you are a Burnley fan just kind of stay away from all that nonsense yeah! 
moving away from the pitch. So, interesting news. I'm 50-50 on. I'm not, I'm probably more 70-30. Good to bad. But Peter, uh, sorry, Bardsley signed a new contract. Obviously, Tanya announced it on Instagram, so it wasn't a well-kept secret. I'm, I've been a massive fan of Bardsley over the years. You know, I don't think you can knock anybody who puts the claret and blue shirt on it and gives 100%. Because at the end of the day, some, sometimes you can lack, you know, you, you can excuse players for a little bit of a lack of quality at times. Even though Bardsley's a good player, but he always gives 100%. So he signed a new deal. Um, so I give my opinion. What's your opinion on that, Tom? Yeah, he's a, a steady Eddie, and he's. Uh, I've never seen him have a shocking game, and I've never seen him have a fantastic game. He's six and a half, seven out of ten every week. But sometimes that's what you need, especially in a backup. If you've got injuries in that position, or whatever, you want yeah. someone you can draft in and be dependable. Now, I think the only the question mark over it for me is not so much giving him another year because I I think he'll be fit enough, and you know I don't think he'll be playing thirty odd games, so I don't think it's a massive you know risk or whatever. And I'm not too worried if he has to play ten games. I think the question mark for me is what it says about our strategy this summer. So for me, it, it, it represented quite a good opportunity to to rejuvenate yeah. it right back. Now, I think Lowton has been playing really well the, the last two, three months, and maybe that's caused some of the thinking. Because I would have said, if you'd have asked me two, three months ago, I would have said what what the priority in the first 11 would be to upgrade a right back, and you could keep Lowton as back up and let Bardsley go. So maybe the thinking is, well, Lowton's been playing really well, He's got the shirt for next season and we've got back up there. We can give him another year. We can kick that problem down the road from the year. But, to, to, you know, if you were to put a negative slant on it, what you might think there is that's a position where we haven't got, a, you know, any young talent coming through that, I mean, that I'm aware of. And, you know, it's a, a position where, you know, we, we, when we had Ward playing there, we bought Taylor, sort of built him up and now he's a first team player. We're not doing the same thing on the right hand side. There was clamouring for Bogle last season. He ended up going to Sheffield United. Um, so to me, is this a, a bit of an indication from the board that that same transfer strategy is is going to be a priority? Is it we're not going to go, you know, spending five ten million on a, a young championship player who could do that job when we can just spend, you know, zero transfer fee, chuck by the signing on fee, and, uh, and and keep the two right backs we've got? So I, I guess the proof of the pudding will be what happens in the summer at right back. Do we get a third choice in? a young lad who can learn the ropes from them two and, and eventually push for a first team place mm. or do we just stick with them two in the summer and I think as well as Leighton's been playing and as much as I think Bardsley is a fine backup choice I think that will be a bit of a worry if, if they are only two right backs coming to start the next season Just a few points to dissect I, I 100% agree with absolutely everything you've, you've said there, and, and I'm not just saying it um, to, you know, to be nice I think two or three months ago Right back was one of my priority positions, and, and Lowton, or uh, you know, or uh, uh, Matt Cafu, who's being more affectionately known as now, has kind of like you know, come up, you know, been been. I'd say he's been our best player, you know, this last couple of months. Um, maybe they're looking at it and going, you know, we've analysed this season. We'll leave right back for another year and spend it in other positions. And like you said, Tom. You know, there, there might be a young right back in the squad who, who's coming up. I know they've signed that Richard Narty, who's been at Chelsea, who's about 22, so they might rate him. I'm not sure where that Gomez Mancini plays, the French lad. I'm, I'm sure I've heard he's a full back, but correct me if I'm wrong, because it could end up being a striker. Sorry, I think he plays middle of the field. Okay, so, so, so I've got that wrong. So, you know, going, going to the wider picture. Um, I actually think there's other positions that do need prioritising. At the start of the season, I would have actually said that we're really strong in central midfield and a striker. And all of a sudden, I think this season, it's been highlighted that I actually think we really need two of those players. Uh, sorry, players in those positions, in, in my opinion. And we also really need a right winger, which, which is the absolute critical position. You know, Do you, do you agree with those positions that I've said? Or, or do you still think right back is a... Is, is a position that we 100% need to strengthen in the summer. Yeah, I think um, the obvious <clears throat> the obvious one is is wing because we realistically we've got one one player who can play every week there, so you need at least two wingers coming in. And I think midfield you've got probably three. I mean, depends what you think about <clears throat> Stevens, but I I wouldn't be averse to getting a, fo- a fourth choice in there to play ahead of him. I think Vidra is going to go. So I think we're going to need to replace him. And I'd like to replace him with someone 
Do you? Have a similar profile, yeah. Uh, he, he, I think he wanted to go in the summer, didn't he? And the only reason he's got a new one-year deal is so he can get some money for it. So I think he'll, he'll be gone. And I think I'd like I'd like to see his replacement with someone, yeah, some similar kind of profile, someone who's got a bit different to Wooden Barnes. But we'll have to see what happens with that. Um, that that'll only be a priority if Fidra does go, but I do think he will. So, uh, yeah, I suppose when you put it like that, say if there is only let's, I'll just pluck a magic number out there and have fifty million quid to spend. <laughs> Not much chance we're going to spend fifty million or anything in the summer. But say if there was fifty million, and we'll right, nice, <laughs> yeah, would wouldn't it? But say if you spent. 20 of that on wingers, 10 of it on a midfielder and 20 of it on centre forwards or whatever. I guess you, I guess you could say, yeah, looking at it like that, then right back is down the, the priority list if you can get away with it from the year. So from that from that perspective, it does make sense. And possibly a centre-half too, maybe, you know, maybe maybe two centre-halves if Tarkovsky leaves, but I think that's a, you know, that centre-half situation is a conversation for, you know, maybe for another podcast if and when. Taki does go this summer. So I think that brings us on quite nicely to Everton. As I said before, it's, it's personally a big game for me. I've got a lot of good Everton fans, you know, good lads, good football fans, but I still desperately want to beat them. Um, I, I don't think, I think we've got a real chance of, you know, going over and getting a result. Everton look a little bit jaded to me recently. They've not been playing as well as they have been. They've got a few injuries. The record at home against some of the lesser teams isn't too strong, which is which, which is interesting. Um, so, Tom, are you confident going into that game? Yeah, it's a game that I don't see is getting a good slapping in. I think Everton are quite uh, similar. They sort of do what we do uh, in, in some of the games that I've seen, especially away games. You know, they, they do what we do, but better. You know, with better players, so they'll make a goal and they'll defend it well. They'll keep the shape. They won't. Uh, they won't commit too much if they don't have to. Um, you know, it's not often you see them give someone a good. 3-4-0. You know, the West Brom game is a good example, I think. You know, they've, they've ground out a 1-0 and it, it works for them. You know, it's, uh, I'm not knocking it at all, but I think it's it, it gives us a chance. You know, I don't think they're going to come and, uh, you know, start landing haymakers on us and put three or four passes. I think if we go there and keep it solid, then we can do what we did at the turf and, you know, sort of uh, keep it as a, a war of attrition, keep, keep it tight. And uh, it might be the sort of game where one goal either way decides it. And as you said, their home record, they've lost to Newcastle, they've lost to Fulham. So teams like us can go there. And uh, and if we can nick a goal, then if we can nick the first goal, especially then, I'd give us a chance. So, yeah, I think I'm not uh, I'm not getting carried away, but I think there's a chance that we can get something out of that game. A point, I'd be very happy. I'd be very happy with that. Yeah, I think I'd definitely take a point. And as we've mentioned a few times, with Fulham playing Man City, you know that will get the gap to five points, and you can keep building that. I think a point will, you know, would be a good result. But like you said, if we can get that first goal, which, which is very crucial in our games, there's no reason why we can't hold on. I thought we actually played really well against Everton uh, when we got that one-up, one-all draw. So that was quite early in the season. I think that was a bit of a game where, you know, we did start to see an improvement in performances. And obviously, Tom's mate Brady scored a really good goal um, in that game, um, which would be nice if he could come off the bench and do something similar so obviously team wise injuries obviously we're not sure on Taylor he went off it, it didn't look like he wanted to come off so we'll see if he's fit obviously you know Peters will, will come in who has actually impressed me recently um, I, you know I, I was never he was a bit of a cult hero Peters but I, I was never actually that big of a fan of his but I think since Taylor's latest injury he's done well and hopefully hopefully the rest of the players will be fit obviously if Cork's fit, Tom, do you bring him back in? Yeah, for me, I don't think Brownell did. I, I didn't do much wrong against Arsenal, but he didn't do a lot either way. I think Cork's, I think Cork's a better prospect than Brownell in midfield at the minute. So yeah, for me, if Cork was fit, I'd bring him back in. I think we managed it quite well in terms of you know, uh, Johan got an hour and he was fine. Brady got half an hour and he was okay. I was a bit surprised Wood stayed on the whole game. I thought maybe he'd only give Wood an hour and then. Yeah, uh, you know, give him a bit of a rest because he he got rushed back quite quick, but then he was playing well, so that makes sense. Hopefully, he's he's fit enough to do the ninety. But again, we've had that benefit of having a midweek break now, like you said earlier. That's going to help us, I think, for the rest of the season. So, uh, yeah, ho- hopefully Taylor and Cork are in contention, but I, I wouldn't be too worried if it was Peters and Brown either. Yeah, 
I just really like Cork. Um, I just think, me personally, I think he's our best midfielder. I know, I think those three are very, very similar. I just think Cork just adds, maybe maybe he's my type of player, I, I'm not sure. I just think think he brings a bit more technical ability and, and a bit of calmness and an ability to retain the ball in midfield, which we do struggle with at times. I think Westwood and Brown are the two fine players, but I do think they're quite similar to you know to play together. Um, so, so yeah, I think that that's the team. Go on then, Tom. What's the what's the score like that you're gonna give? Uh, well, I said it for Arsenal, and uh, I'll probably say similar for this one. I think it'll be a well, I said nil nil for Arsenal to be fair, but a low scoring draw. I think again, nil nil or one one. I think. Uh, like you say, Everton aren't in the best of form at the minute. They're not really scoring goals. Same goes for us. So, uh, I think, uh, yeah, a war of attrition, a slightly boring draw, I'd be happy with that. Yeah, I agree with that, Tom. I think we'll actually, we'll have enough to, you know, get a draw. So, fingers crossed, but God, let's all we do get a win. I think it'll be a massive, massive three points for, for, for us going into that um, long break that, that we've got. I think that would be absolutely huge. So, Tom, before we wrap up, any other pressing issues that you can think of, Clarence wise <laughs> I did. I, I felt I felt a bit rude bringing it up at the time, but I, when uh, you asked George earlier about Woods, um, Woods' <laughs> chance, you know, Vidra played him in, and he said he put it wide. I thought, did he watch that? <laughs> <one>? I know. <laughs> I just <laughs> you tried to put it in the corner. I wouldn't have blamed. Yeah, I think I'd have preferred to put him. Yeah, I think I'd have preferred to put him wide <laughs> and straight. I don't know if you're now, but. I am going to do that. So anyway, while we're having a bit of a pop yeah, and charge. It was, that, it was a poor miss, that. Like, at that yeah. point in the game. Yeah, I was just going to say, while we're having a bit of a pop and charge, was it a bad miss? Because I thought it was. <laughs> yeah, it's poor. It, 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 it's, it's one of them where I think you just think, I'll just put my foot through it. But either side of the keeper or do what Vidra did against Leicester and, I, and put it in the top corner, it's not, he's not saving that. But... The one place he's going to keep that out is if you hit it straight at him, and that's what he did. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, I thought that was disappointing, to be honest. And that, I, and that was like, I thought at yeah, that point, well, we're not going to win this now. Let's hope we get the draw. And that's why I was quite glad of a point in the end, because from that point on, Arsenal could have had two or three. Pepe missed a shit, uh, had that one cleared off the line. And then God went to buy us at the post at the end. Yeah, you say I'm uh, Mr. Cool, Mr. Unflappable, but bloody hell. My heart was going then for that one, I tell you. <laughs> I know, it was too much for early on on a Saturday. <laughs> wasn't it but no like I said um, again a, a good draw from the Clarets uh, you know against a very very good side I thought the perf- you know going back to the game before I thought the performance against Leicester was absolutely superb we, 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 we actually battered in my opinion a very very good side the long parts and then backed it up with a you know with a good second half performance and a good battling draw and again yeah the gaps tightened at the bottom but I still think we're in good shape to you know to get enough points and you know and, and be I won't say be, be comfortable, comfortable, but stay up this season. And yeah, looking forward to the tea time game against Everton on, on Saturday. Hopefully get a, a, a win and enjoy a few beers on the back of that. So cheers, Tom. Uh, cheers, George, even though you're not here. Uh, cheers, Tom. Cracking again. By the way, obviously, you can't see Tom because we're doing a podcast. Tom's got an absolutely belting. Ken, is it Kendall Town? Kit on. So before we leave, Tom, do you want to tell the viewers about your, or the listeners about your, Football manager um, et, um, experience with with Kendall. I'm not sure if I actually want everyone knowing about <laughs> this, but <laughs> so I had uh, football managers 2010 to 2009. Uh, I've had the same save game running for 11 years. So um, as a as a bit of a presence, so I've, I've been managing Kendall Town now in the Premier League, and I think it's 21-10 or something. It's something stupid. So uh, as a as a a birthday present. My brother-in-law bought as a official Kendall Town replica top. It's got the name of my favourite region on the back. So I've worn that for today's podcast, and it, uh, it's, pr- it's proved a talking point. <laughs> Brilliant, Out- outstanding. I just think that's absolutely outstanding. And yeah, I think Tom's employed anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, cheers, 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 everyone. Um, have a great rest of the week, um, and let's all for a Clavitz win at the weekend. Many thanks to Rich, Tom and George for bringing us that analysis tonight. Natalie and Dave will be back on Friday with a preview show ahead of Saturday Tea Time's trip to Goodison Park. Stay safe, Clarets. We'll see you soon.